Hello, welcome to a new tutorial presented by the SA Charles VB. This tutorial, we are going to continue with the pancreatic, the pancreas endocrine pathology. Now, the endocrine pathology of the pancreas, we have the diabetes mellitus, and we need to know that the endocrine pathology of the pancreas is based on the alpha and the beta cells of the pancreas. The alpha cells of the pancreas secrete glucagon, while the beta cells secrete insulin. And now, this pathology is going to be with respect to our main feature in endocrine pathology that we initially said, which is hypersecretion of the hormone or hyposecretion of the hormone. But with respect to the pancreas, the major pathology that's going to be involved here is going to be the hyposecretion of a particular hormone of great importance in the body, that is insulin. So that is going to cause, that is going to make our chapter to be completely surrounded on diabetes mellitus. So from here we start with type 1 diabetes mellitus. So now let's start. Diabetes mellitus type 1 disease. Diabetes mellitus type 1 uncontrolled increase in blood glucose level due to insulin production, due to lack of insulin production. So the cause you are going to have HLA DR3 and HLA DR4. So this is a genetic cause where your beta cells have HLA DR3 and HLA DR4 inside it. Now, upon having some viral infection like mumps or or having viral infection like Kogzaki, you can have the re or even measles. You can have the release of the HLA-DR3 and HLA-DR4, which can enhance the destruction of the beta cells, resulting to diabetes mellitus type one. Now, the epidemiology: approximately 10% of cases usually occur in young patients. Only 10% of cases. At first, diabetes mellitus was thought to be occurring mostly in the young ages. That's why it was initially called a juvenile diabetes mellitus. But now the name has changed to diabetes mellitus type 1. Now you see approximately 10% of ages then of cases usually occur in young patients, only 10%, so 90% in older patients. But can occur at any age, approximately 25% with type 1 diabetes mellitus initially present with diabetes ketoacidosis. So the main feature of um, type 1 diabetes is diabetes ketoacidosis. And we're going to see um, in um, under that the main feature of type 2 diabetes, um, diabetes mellitus is instead hyperosmolar non-ketotic um, state. Now the consequence of uh, such manifestation, so here you only have the consequence, the main sign symptom of diabetes without any complication. You have the sign symptom of um, diabetes insipidus plus hyperglycemia for the sign symptom of the hyperglycemia. So you're going to have um, polyuria is due to hyperglycemia causing um, increased glucose in the urine. So this is the part of the you have polydipsia, increased consumption of water. Um, due to your loss of water, result in hyperosmolarity. Hyper, uh, the increased consumption results from hypo, hyperosmolarity and water loss from the polyuria. These processes simulate the test. Now you have polyphagia because your glucose in the body is not used by the body, but the insect break down your, uh, your, the, your, your other stores of food substances into glucose. Now, what is the pathophysiology now for for the diabetic ketoacidosis? So, how does diabetic ketoacidosis occur? Diabetic ketoacidosis occurs when your body converts the fatty substances into ketone bodies. So, because your body you do not produce um, enough insulin, what happens is that your body is going to produce um, the food is going to convert the triglyceride stores in the adipocyte to ketone bodies for it to be used. Now the ketone solution can be produced are you have beta hydroxy uh, you have beta hydroxy beta, beta butanoid beta hydroxy um, butanoid and you can have also um, 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 acetone and lastly you can have acetyl um, acetyl acetone so these are the three main ketone bodies that are involved but the one which is mostly produced is the beta hydroxy are um, butanoid so now, 
So you have a hyperglycemia. When you have a hyperglycemia greater of 250 mg per deciliter, you, are, you can already investigate for, you can already think of type 1 diabetes. When you add up with the ketosis, you also see type 1 diabetes and you have a metabolic acidosis with anion gap, you also have type 1 diabetes. The macro and the micro presentation, nothing is said on that, but what is already known is that on the micro presentation, you will have a chronic a granulomatous infiltration, lymphocytic infiltration inside the pancreas. Now, the difference between type 1 and type 2 diabetes mellitus, you have age, usually 10 to 20 years, but it's not again very possible, and this year is usually older. Genetic composition, yeah, with the type 1 diabetes, the genetic association is weak, but the type 2 is very strong. Associated acute and acute complication, you have diabetic ketoacidosis, yeah, it's hyper or small and non ketotic coma. We have associated um, with obesity. This one is no. Yeah, this this one is usually associated with obesity. Presenting um, symptoms. You have polyuria, polydysia, polyfascia, polyphagia. Here is weakness. Here is weight loss. You, at first, the patient was obese. Then he has a sudden weight loss, and then he has infection and weakness. So you have weakness, weight loss, infection. These are the presenting symptoms. Yeah, the presenting symptoms are polyuria, polydipsia, and polyphagia. So the presenting factor for complication. So what are the presenting factors for the complication to occur? You have infection, neuro diabetes mellitus, you have stress, and you have insulin um, deficiency. So Explain the pathogenicity of diabetic ketoacidosis. Yeah, we said that you cannot easily, you cannot use the um, glucose storage of, you cannot use the glucose uh, and the carbohydrate storage of your body. So what happened is that the fatty acid, you need to know that the body, the body and the brain and some other parts of the body do not, um, do not feed on fatty acid. So what happened is that when you convert the triglyceride and the proteins to form amino acid, the own other parts of the body are going to feed on amino acid and are going to feed on fatty acid to produce your energy, like the muscles and the bones. But the brain cannot feed on fatty acids. So what happens is that there is a need for the production of ketone bodies to replace sugar. The brain can only feed on glucose and ketone bodies. So there is a need for the production of ketone bodies for the brain. So now, so diabetic ketoacidosis, what happens is that um, there is going to be the conversion of the triglyceride now to form the ketone bodies, to pass through the fatty acid and form the ketone bodies. So when form the ketone, the ketone body that is going to be formed is beta hydroxyl, beta hydroxyl BGA. And this ketone body now is going to increase the um, acidity of blood and the anion gap, which is going to result in signs and symptoms of diabetic ketoacidosis. So now, what are the presentation of diabetic ketoacidosis? Also, lastly, you need to know that the ketone, um, the ketone acidosis is going to cause serum potassium is usually normal, elevated despite to heavy urine losses. So you have serum potassium normal, and the patient's total body potassium stores. So you see that there is depletion of total um, um, potassium stores in case of diabetic ketoacidosis. So. In case of diabetic ketoacidosis, you are going to have a depletion of potassium um, stores. So after the person is going to suffer from signs of hypokalemia. Clinical presentation of diabetic ketoacidosis. We have symptoms, nausea, vomiting, thirst, abdominal pain. So we have the clinical symptom of diabetic ketoacidosis. We have nausea. The patient has nausea. He vomits a lot. So because of excess hydrogen ion want to be secreted, it brings the water molecules we eat. We have um, so nausea, we have vomiting, we have thirst, we have um, abdominal pain, we have weakness, and we have fatigue. Signs, we have um, tachycardia, we have pure skin sugar, we have warm and dry skin. Patient also have ketones on the breath, he smells ketone and altered metastasis. So the symptoms, we have nausea, vomiting, thirst, abdominal pain, weakness, fatigue, signs, tachycardia, poor skin to go, warm and dry skin. Patient also have ketone on bread, altered mental status. So now, 
and describe that what you finding if you have hyperglycemia and nyon gaps and serum ketones so these are the laboratory findings of diabetic ketoacidosis now patient feels sick so they present earlier than patient with hyper or smaller non ketotic coma so type 2 diabetes you need to know that this disease uncontrolled blood glucose due to insulin resistance this time around it is mainly genetic and you can have obesity now epidemiology type 2 diabetes mellitus represent 80 to 90 percent of cases of diabetes mellitus so 80 percent so it usually occurs in older patients 40 years and obese individual but can occur in children as age of um, 66 years old risk factor for development of includes sedentary life cycle. so what happened with type 2 diabetes mellitus you need to know that with type 2 diabetes mellitus you can have both a genetic cause and, and um, a, a, a cause of sedentary life so the main thing with type 2 the part of the type 2 diabetes measures is mainly via um, the part of surgery is mainly via insulin resistance so what happens is that with type 2 diabetes measures the patient is obese or the patient has a sedentary life so you can have a type 2 diabetes measures which, which can have a genetic origin or an, acquire, or an acquired origin the genetic origin of the type 2 diabetes is that as a patient grows older what happens is that there is going to be the deformation of the insulin receptors so the deformation of insulin receptor is going to do an insulin resistance so the cells are not going to respond again to the insulin so since the cells are not responding again to insulin what happens is that there is going to be increased hyperglycemia increased glucose intolerance and thus the person is going to um, have um, diabetes mellitus type 2 another form is the acquired form the acquired form can either be due to obesity or sedentary life and poor diet so obesity causes um, type 2 diabetes mellitus by insulin resistance because obese people are going to produce via their they are, are going to have excess adipocyte the excess adipocytes are going to produce adipokines and adipokines are um, going to be stored on the insulin receptors are going to stay on insulin receptors which are going to prevent the insulin from binding to the receptors and causing insulin resistance in the other way around you have sedentary lifestyle and poor diet Sedentary lifestyle and poor diet is going to cause you are um, if somebody takes excess glucose without using it, you realize that there is going to be excess insulin secretion from the pancreas. Excess insulin secretion from the pancreas every day and for a long period of time is going to cause a down regulation of the uh, the receptors, insulin receptors on the cells. So down regulation of insulin receptors on the cells is going to now cause. Um, the insulin resistance and this is going to cause an increase in glucose tolerance this is going to cause glucose intolerance instead so now um, consequence slash manifestation here you know, there is weakness weight loss susceptibility to infection so now and um, there is difference between the manifestation of type 2 diabetes and manifestation of type 1 diabetes type 1 diabetes manifestation is polyuria polydipsia like in um, diabetes in species right now in type 2 diabetes the manifestation are weakness so the person was first obese and then suddenly become weak weakness and susceptibility to infection so these are the main manifestation pathophysiology genetic factors play an important role so explain already this pathophysiology now we have investigation we have single random um, glucose level if you want to differ to differentiate between glucose intolerance and you want to differentiate between glucose intolerance and type 2 diabetes measures you will need to perform the other test but the main test to perform is the fasting glucose level when you're fasting glucose level you can add other tests to see the difference between um, glucose tolerance and, um, and um, type 2 diabetes give an important point with type 2 diabetes it is commonly thought that type 1 diabetes develop dka and type 2 develop hyper or smaller non-ketotic um, coma but in practice the 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 diabetic ketoacidosis is very common with type 1 and type 2 diabetic patient 
whereas the hyperosmotic osmotic coma is unusual. Brief explain hyperosmotic coma. So the hyperosmotic order, what is hyperosmotic name or hyper hyperosmolar or smaller non ketotic coma? Mark hyperglycemia, no metabolic acidosis, no ketonia. So you have mark hyperglycemia with no ketonemia, more dehydration than DKE. So here you have dehydration. So you have hyper or smaller. So in this case, you see, you see that there is loss of excess, um, the, uh, loss of excess um, water in your urine. So you are going to have hyper or smaller blood. So you have no ketone bodies, you have more dilation than, than DKA, low um, free fatty acid level, you have low free fatty acid level in this case, but in the case of the ketotic, you have a high free fatty acid level and you have zero osmolarity is very high. So important points of diabetes um, type 2, we have um, hemoglobin A1 is the determined amount of glycosylated. This can be forgotten for now. Explain the pathogenesis of diabetic com complication. So we have activation of polyol pathway with accumulation of sorbitol. So these are the different pathogenesis through which diabetic um, <coughs> complication and can arise. We have activation of polyol pathway with accumulation of sorbitol. We have production of advanced glycosylation end product from non enzymatic glycosylation. So you can see that this glycosylation can occur. So the, uh, the excess glucose in the blood is going to cause a non enzymatic glycosylation. That is, the glucose are going to bind with each other and are going to bind with the blood vessel. We have increased oxidative um, damage. Increased oxidative damage. We have polyol um, for um, pathway with um, polyol pathway with um, accumulation of sorbitol. What happened here is that the glucose can easily form, um, can easily hydroxylate and form polyols. So with accumulation of and sorbitol can accumulate because sorbitol cannot pass into the body, into the body tissues. We have platelet dysfunction associated with um, increased aggression. So we have increased aggression of the platelets. Need to know that glucose. If we you take excess glucose and put it and, and put it um, in water, you realize when glucose when you touch um, the glucose when you have placed in water, it is it is um placed, it is like gumming. So this uh, can show that excess glucose in your blood is going to cause a gum um, a, an aggression of your blood. So your platelets are also going to dysfunction and go to going to do aggregation. So this is because when you place glucose in water, excess glucose can also function as um, a form of gum or aggregation. Give the complication of diabetes mellitus. Now the complication of diabetes mellitus has respect to the vessels, we have respect to the kidney, we have respect to the eye, we have the, the gastroparesis. Now and you have the nervous system. Now, with respect to the vessels, you need to know that there is glycosylation that occurs with respect to the vessels. Now, with vessels, there are two main vessels which are affected. We have um, macro vessels and we have micro vessels. The macro vessels, the affection of the macro vessels is their atherosclerosis because you say that this means is going to cause free fatty acid um, re um, release. The free fatty acid releases are going to cause an um, atherosclerotic plaques which are going to be produced on macro vessel. But with respect to micro vessel, what's going to happen there is going to be this second pathway which is going to occur, which is going to be the glycosylation of the um, the the glucose pathway and also going to be uh, due to the polyol pathway the accumulation of sorbitol. So what happened with the micro vessels is that they are going to be with the glycosylation accumulation of sorbitols. So all these are going to cause a, a sclerosis of the blood vessels. So the sclerosis means um, the the reduction in blood lumen size. So all that are going to reduce the blood movement and then are going to cause an ischemic damage to the, the organs which are coming. So in this case, you also have the kidney. The kidney can also be affected in diabetic and um, renal failure. With diabetic renal failure, you can also have a um, um, diabetic um, kidney. So this diabetic kidney, you see that when you have a glycosylation of the, the kidney vessels, 
you realize that there is going to be um, the, the the proteins are now capable of passing through the glomerular wall. The glycosation is going to cause the the the, the pores of the, the the glomerulus to increase. So the protein that will be capable of passing through the glomerular wall, and so you have microalbuminuria, which is associated with 10 to 20 times increased risk of progression of diabetic nephropathy. So you see that you can have a nephrotic syndrome with diabetes, diabetic nephropathy. So include um, diffuse glomerulonephrosclerosis. When you have a diffuse glomerulonephrosclerosis, this one is um, considered as diabetic nephropathy. Diabetic, diabetics are also at risk for pyelonephritis with risk of um, the um, development of papillary necrosis now with the eye we have a retinopathy so what happened here is that you have um, this microvascular vasculation say that there is glycosylation and accumulation of sorbitol so accumulation of sorbitol are going to reduce the lumen size of the retinal artery and cause a, a retinopathy so now you can have a non-proliferative or proliferative retinopathy now you can also have cataract non positive retinopathy is due to increased capillary permeability dilation of vessel venous and presence of micro uh, aneurysm while proliferative is due to renal ischemia so there is a proliferative one due to renal ischemia due to accumulation of due to glycosylation and all that and there is no proliferative one which is instead due to increased capillary permeability to the proteins so this is non-proliferative one peripheral nervous um, the nervous system is due to, see due to ischemia we have gastroparesis the reduction in the function of the gastrointestinal system skin and soft tissue and you can have easy septicemia septicemia can easily occur because um, the um, you see that you have a excess glucose level and you know that the bacteria are very attracted to high glucose level so when you have easy when you have an infection when you have a, a wound the bacterial infection can easily occur on your wound and you know that you also have a neuroparesis that is you don't feel with with diabetes patient diabetes patient does not do not easily feel um sensation so a wind development can occur in a particular region without patient even without the um on on knowing that the um, of the of the patient the patient cannot know that a, a wound is at a specific location this can also increase the risk of septicemia so from here we've seen all the pathology the main pathology involving the pancreas and we say thanks for your kind attention